In his expanded commentary on these particular verses, Swami Kriyananda makes a very interesting point. He, he talks about the fact that um, the infinite spirit becomes uh, identified and manifested individually. That's what we are. Um, we, we talk about the individual soul, but the English word for that is not really exact because soul can also mean the infinite spirit. It gets a little confusing. In Sanskrit, we have the word jiva, which is a very nice word because jiva just means the bubble, which may merge back into the sea, the infinite sea, but it's always that individual part. So the jiva is the eternal part of us that yet becomes identified with each of these individual incarnations and lives through each one of them. But that infinite spirit, which is never touched, which can never die, which once manifested, exists for all eternity as individuals, is what we call the jiva. In uh, the early years of spiritual practice, when people were trying to assume attitudes, perhaps a little beyond themselves, to refer to oneself as this jiva was sort of a way of never saying the word I. Um, it was a little pretentious and a tiny bit awkward. This jiva is going into town to have, uh, see a movie and have a pizza. Sounds a little strange. <laughs> it's not exactly a, a harmony of concepts. But nonetheless, it's true, and that's how we want to talk about it. But what happens is, as Swami describes it, when we're one with the spirit, we're manifested in three stages. There's the causal plane, the astral plane, and the physical plane. This is the esoteric reason why it took, why Jesus, it was three days, the resurrection process was a hint of those three levels. And at each of those levels, that which is fully conscious of all of creation and of its own true nature begins to become more and more identified with only a fragment of that nature. Because our ego and our life experience in this physical world is, is a reality. It's not like it, it doesn't exist on its own level. It is simply not what it seems. And as Swamiji describes it, and I have to only quote him because these are not things I know myself, on the causal plane, even though there is this sense of individuality, we are fully conscious of the fact that an, that individuality is part of the infinite. And that we, we understand that everything exists only on the level of divine thought, of the divine dream. So even though we feel ourselves as the bubble in the sea, we recognize that the sea is our greater reality. In the astral world, which is where we go between physical births, and most of us live between the astral and the, and the material world, the energy universe, all of the movies and so on that are telling us about heaven and about what happens when we die. Is all, it's all about the astral universe. And the astral universe is a reflection of our consciousness. So if we're dark and evil, we go to a dark and evil astral universe, but it's a non-material world. And there our sense of individuality is much stronger. We're more strongly identified with it than, than we are on the causal level. But we're still more aware, much more aware than we are in the physical world, that the reality emanates from inside. And that the in, inner world is the real world and the outer world merely reflects it. Just in the same way that I stand here and I move my hands outward, you know, standing here like this, you can see that the hands emanate from whatever it is inside of me that chooses to move them. Now, mostly in the physical world, as I'll explain in a moment, we lose contact with that. But in the astral world, because on that level we can keep that awareness more, Yogananda describes in his autobiography of a yogi uh, th uh, what the astral worlds are like and how those who dwell in the astral worlds can manifest merely by the power of their thought, whatever it is they're thinking about. They can make the weather be a certain way. You can make, it says, a tree produce any fruit that you particularly want to eat at that moment. You can mutate your own form. You can really become the flowers or the trees or, or an attractive animal that you want to be and then come back into a human form. Now, we all have a, a sense of that living on the physical plane, a sort of a, literally a memory of, the, of being able to do that. 
But once we get into the physical plane, from the very beginning, the nature of the physical body is such that the attention is completely outward. I remember I had the uh, privilege of being with a, a friends of mine when their daughter was born. And the daughter had a very slight bit of distress in the first few moments of her little life, of her small body's life. And so the nurse took her away to another place to just clear out her lungs. And the mother was in no position to go with the baby, but the father went with the baby and I just trailed along. The baby was five minutes old. And already she was reaching up and had a grip of her father's hand, her father's finger. He was a big man, had a big finger. She had a tiny little hand, but she's gripping it. And I was so struck by that fact. She was minutes old. She had just come out of the womb, and already she was reaching up and holding on to something physical in this physical world. Because right from the start, the nature of this um, incarnation is that everything looks outward. All of our senses look outward. And so our sense of who and what I am is very strongly defined in an outward way. And we see this world around us and we naturally assume that this is who I am. Now, the interesting factor, and this is what the Bhagavad Gita is trying to say to us, we are no more outward merely because we live in the physical world than we are when we're living in the astral world. The source of our being, the true nature of our being, is still infinite and is still emanating from this inner consciousness. It's just that we get confused. We just get confused because of where we are and what's going on. If you ever enter into a, a, a fun house, as they call they used to call them, I don't think they really exist anymore, but at a fairgrounds or something, and you go in and the mirrors are all spinning like this, even on a more refined level, the Birla Temple in New Delhi, I'm pretty sure that's the temple, has a, a, a sort of hall of mirrors where they try to give you a feeling of the infinite nature of Krishna. I believe it's that temple, but somewhere there. And there's an image of Krishna, and they have cleverly built mirrors in all directions. So you're looking in, at the shrine, and the image is repeated again and again and again, literally, infinitely, as far as you can see. And it's an attempt um, to just sort of show you how everything spreads out, even on the physical world. And when you stand in there, the um, optical illusion is so great that you lose sort of a, a, a connection with what normal vision is like. That's what I was saying happens in a fun house. But you step out, and then all of a sudden everything cl clicks back into shape. This world sucks us in to that reality. And most people around us just take the world for what it is. And so nothing about us in an eternal sense has fundamentally changed. But the jiva has become identified with this outward consciousness. And the soul's long journey away from its home in God is this adventure into extreme outward awareness and then the gradual realization that the Jiva is eternal, changeless, once born, can never be destroyed, and is really untouched by any of these experiences. Now, all of spiritual practice is an effort to come back to a conscious moment-by-moment -moment remembrance of who I really am and where my experience of life emanates from. And in, in this path of self-realization, you may gradually learn meditation techniques and eventually Kriya Yoga practice. And the first meditation technique you learn is, is one very commonly taught, not only in this ashram but in others, and it is simply to pay attention to the breath. And it seems too simple. But the fact of the matter is that one very um, obvious source of our life, both physically and on more subtle levels, is the fact that we breathe. But how many of us actually are aware of the fact that we're breathing? We're aware of the fact that we're seeing and hearing and tasting and having physical sensations, but the animating force behind that is breathing. But most of the time, it's just out of our awareness. It doesn't make it less true that we don't remember it. It's just not in our awareness. So what we're beginning 
by simply stopping all the outward stimulation, which is the practice of silent meditation, is we sit. We're not doing, apparently, anything, but we're trying to become aware of what is really the, the everlasting source of who and what we are. So we start with listening, watching the breath, and as you progress toward Kriya, you, be, you then begin to tune into the Om vibration, which is the sound of, of the vibratory creation, which is uh, within us. We hear that with the inner senses, not the outer senses. And then Kriya Yoga practice itself is to concentrate on both breath and Om, and to use your willpower also to live only, at least during the time of your practice, in the inner flow of energy. Because the power behind the breath is actually the flow of inner energy up and down the spine. So Kriya goes behind the breath to feel that up and down flow of energy. And the, the appropriate, the, the real and deep practice of Kriya causes you to recognize that who and what I really am is not this outward manifestation, but literally and only the dynamic divine energy that flows within me. In other words, we're working our way back from the material to the astral to the causal and then to the infinite. Now, explaining all of that, you know, helps us to realize sort of where we're going and what we're trying to do in this world. It was very interesting to me recently, my uh, father's older brother um, lived to be 96, and he died just after Christmas. And it, toward the last years of his life, I sort of suddenly acquired them as relatives, he and his wife, even though growing up we were never very close. As one of my friends said to me, where did you get these relatives? You never had them before. <laughs> just somehow at the end of their lives, I got involved with them, and I was sort of helping them a little bit um, in their, you know, declining years. They had no children of their own. Um, and I had, my uncle, both of them were um, complete materialists, had no belief in anything beyond this world, um, even though my uncle was always intrigued by my nutty ideas. But he, he never, in fact, he would mock them sometimes. I just let him because he wasn't, I figured he didn't know what he was saying by that stage. But... Um, just before Christmas time, let's see, I'd, I had a feeling somehow that I needed to be involved in his dying, and I thought, I was hoping that I could be there when he died, because I, <laughs> despite what he thought, I knew that when his physical body began to go away, even though he was absolutely convinced he would lose consciousness and turn into nothing, I knew for a fact he wouldn't, you know? Because the process of death is a really very simple and very interesting one which is where we hold on to this body, we protect it, we fight for it, and that's the appropriate thing to do, I might add. Because we're given these material bodies, it's a great privilege to have a human body. Because here's a fact about the human body. The nervous system of the human body is refined enough to perceive inner realities. I was looking out the window uh, where we live at Chela Bhavan in the Ananda community, and there's a, there's a lot of trees there, and there's a lot of squirrels there. We do not like the squirrels, I would add, because we do an endless amount of work to grow orchards, to have orchards and grow fruit, really primarily to feed the squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> Nonetheless, there the squirrels are there. And so I'm watching this squirrel, and squirrels are... I mean, a squirrel incarnation must be just horrible, because the squirrel spends most of his life like this, you know, everything the squirrel does is a state of absolute panic, whatever they're doing. And, you know, this is the maximum. We get the body that is the maximum potential of our consciousness to express. He's, he's a squirrel, she's a squirrel, because this is the full awareness that they have, which is one of total terror at all times. You know, and just anxiety about everything. Someone spoke once about rabbits in the same way, saying, everything eats a rabbit. You know, <laughs> that's why rabbits are so timid, because everything eats them. So the squirrel, the squirrel eats everything, but nonetheless, there's the squirrel. And I'm um, thinking about the fact that even though looking at that squirrel from our perspective, it seems like a really awful incarnation, 
That squirrel may have come up from being, who knows what, a cockroach. You know, like, so being a squirrel is this enormous expansion of consciousness for what had been a cockroach or whatever it was before. And he doesn't have any point of contrast. He doesn't remember being able to go out for pizza in a movie because he never could. He only, you know, lived in some, like a gopher underground, and then he got to be a squirrel, and now he can run around in the trees and eat the pears and peaches and apples and almonds. But in any case, I also, you also appreciate when you look, these are the divine laws that Yogananda explains, that that squirrel's nervous system, or the nervous system of a squirrel body, because you see a jiva comes in to be a squirrel, it's not like there is such a thing as a squirrel jiva. It's just a jiva, a spark of the infinite, on its way up to being us, is a squirrel for a while. But that nervous system of that body is not capable of perceiving infinity. Because that jiva has not yet come to the point of awareness where it could. It's just progressing through the animal level. Now, this is a whole subject about incarnation. I'm not going to call for questions right now, but you can ask me later, you know, how this whole thing works. But by the time you get to the human level, the human body does have the capacity to perceive infinity. So it's a great privilege to have a human body and not something to be thrown away lightly. But once you get into one, whatever challenges you're keeping it, you need to fight against at least as long as the body serves your spiritual purpose. When our friend Happy Winningham, who had AIDS and you know, worked against letting her body go for some time, even though she had several um, death and return experiences in which she was like, you know, yippee, how soon can I get out of here? Sort of an attitude, but she kept coming back to her body and then she would have to stay in it a while. And she said to Swamiji at one point, she said, sir, this is like having a bad flu all the time. How long do I have to do this? He said, as long as you are still able to keep the consciousness of God, as long as the body does not completely make it impossible for you to keep expanding your awareness, then you should, you should, it will benefit you to keep it. And uh, she did for a number of more years, and Swami remarked when she finally did let it go, that she learned very valuable spiritual lessons in that effort. Now, coming back to my elderly uncle, there was a time just before Christmas this year when all of a sudden he, he had, you know, ab abdominal obstructions and so on, and he just, he just gave up. He quit, finally. And he didn't want to eat, and he tried to withdraw. They tried to keep him alive for another few weeks. They, I, they gave him an operation, 96 years old, you know, to try to fix it because relatives around him, not, not necessarily having the understanding we do, just couldn't let him go, so to speak. But you see, what happened to him was he suddenly realized that he could let this go. Because letting this go was not really letting himself go. Do you see? Merely to stop eating and taking care of this physical body and just to withdraw back into what he had always been. And this is what happens to all of us when we pass away. And very interestingly, just about the time that that, that period of him withdrawing from the physical body began was our Christmas meditation. And just right in the middle of the Christmas meditation, all of a sudden he was there. And he was there not as an elderly man, but as a very dynamic young man. And he'd been before his body and his brain just gave up. He'd been highly intelligent, very dynamic, very forceful. And it was like through, there was a period of time in that meditation for me when, when he and I were having a, a very serious discussion about the astral world. And I actually thought he was dying at that point. And I didn't know until later that that was a critical point for him when he began to realize that he was going to pull back. You see, there's this other side of us that is always going on. Swami Kriyananda remarked when a, a woman in our community died, Bella, um, she, was, she was born and raised in Russia, and she was a very dynamic and, but complex person. Not, uh, and uh, it's often people who were raised in Eastern Europe, you know, develop a, a sort of multiple, multiple levels of personality 
because they she grew up under communism and you did not put yourself out in that culture you tried to be invisible in fact recently when some of our American friends went to Moscow where we have a, a meditation group and they were going around with a group of Russians and there's a whole two-tiered economy one for tourists and one for Russians and they were trying to keep our American friends in the Russian economy because everything costs a fraction of what it does to the foreign economy but they kept saying to them you must stop smiling so much everyone will know you're not Russian <laughs> you're just like that because it's just the habit of masking your feelings but when Bella died it was very interesting Swami remarked he said more than almost anyone else I know who she was was not what she wore on the outside you know that she kept the majority of her nature on the inner level and just in a sense didn't bother to bring it out isn't that interesting now a true master and depending well I should say it just depends on your mission depends on why you're here and what you're doing whether or not like an avatar or like someone like Swami Kriyananda who has a huge worldwide work to do everything that's inside of you needs to be brought forward because that's the work that you're doing but Swami talked about a self-realized master he met in India Yogi Ramya who just lived in this little village in a tiny hut and as he put it most of his conversations with the people around him were about food and the weather but inwardly he had an infinite awareness and he blessed the planet with that awareness but very little of who he was on the inside needed to come out on the outside now for us as devotees living in this world what we're trying to do is very simple who am I why am I here where does my happiness come from how do I live in such a way that I can be in that infinite bliss and not merely just a cork bobbing around on this ocean of spirit it's a, an enormously fascinating challenge isn't it and all of our spiritual practices whether they're the explicit practices of Kriya Yoga as I was describing whether it's prayer whether it's uh, what we call Japa which is repeating the name of God chanting service whatever it might be all of it is designed to allow us to live as our karma has brought us into these physical bodies but with a simultaneous and continuous awareness of who and what we really are eternal forever living unchanged untouched there's such a sweet um, story of Anandamoy Ma who was a great uh, saint in India she died in the early 80s Swami Kriyananda knew her well in an autobiography of a yogi master visits her in 1936 the joy permeated mother she is called Anandamoy Ma is kind of like a very close aunt to our spiritual family you know she's not one of our line of gurus but she's she's a, a also a mother she's a foster mother to all of us and she was born with this um, state of consciousness and did did spiritual practice in sadhana but she she was discovered essentially having this state of consciousness and when Yogananda asked her mother tell me a little bit about your life she says I was born into a physical body I grew up as in this village and I was always the same and then at a certain point my family chose to marry me uh, marry me to this man named Bolanat who was her husband um, not in any conventional sense but nonetheless he was her husband and then she said and I was always the same and then when this body as she used to refer to herself and for her it was not an affectation she did not go to town to have pizza and movies you know she would call herself this body this body was taken to this place and I was always the same and now you see me before you and I am always the same all these things happened and she was able to describe them happening and even a, a master has to have enough identification with the body that they inhabit to keep it going you know to know which one to, to walk around in and which one to dress although Yogananda at the end of his life Swami Kriyananda tells us he was walking and he was leaning on Swami Kriyananda's arm and he stumbled like this and master looked at Swamiji and he said 
I am in so many bodies, sometimes I forget which one I'm supposed to keep going. Isn't that a, a, an extraordinary way to say it? You know? Because his identification was so light, especially as, his, the, he, was, as he was nearing the end of his incarnation, that he would just lose track. Oh, is that my sweater? Oh, I guess that is my purse. You know, you sort of not, don't quite remember for a moment because you're thinking of something else. Imagine having that same feeling towards your own body. That I am this infinite, unborn, unchanged, undying spirit, and I inhabit this for a while. It's, it's definitely and absolutely the only reason we're here. We're here to use this physical body to identify with everything that's beyond it. Now, you have to understand, it's fine, therefore, to live out the karma that this body dem demands of you. I'm very often asked, and people become confused because we say we're supposed to be detached, and so it, we begin to try to do violence to our own nature. We try to break this attachment sort of with a saw, like this. You know, that doesn't help. If you're so busy trying to saw it apart, you're more conscious of it than ever because you're always repudiating it. That's not really the way to expand. The way to expand is, well, as Ananda Ma herself said, we don't overcome our detachments by battling against those attachments. We do it by bringing in more and more love for God. Isn't it so? I mean, if you used to drink Folger's instant coffee, and then you start going somewhere and learning about very, very refined co coffees, and you taste this one and taste that one. You don't have to work really hard to not want the instant coffee anymore. It's just like, ah, oh, it just doesn't taste very good to me now that I've discovered this. So people will ask questions, oh, I really want to have a baby, but, but I don't want to get attached. And I think, well, you know, in the act of giving birth to a child and to raising that child, what one discovers really is the incredible joy of giving and the selflessness and the thrill of helping someone else. A friend of mine who was a very talented ballet dancer and very well respected in his own right, after his career was done, he started teaching. And he said to me afterwards, it was so sweet. He said, I thought the greatest thrill was performing. I always thought so. He said, but now I've discovered that it's watching others whom I've helped to learn how to perform. You see? That's what we find out. We find out that not that this is bad, but this is better. But we'll never find that out unless we flow into that. It's not a question. We can't get out of this reality by just clenching our fists and pushing it away. We transcend this reality by recognizing birth, life, death, you know, motherhood, success, failure, sickness, health. I am always the same. By in the midst of it, expanding our awareness to that infinite self within from which everything flows, that bliss state which is our true nature, which is who and what we really are, which becomes all of this. That's the state of the masters, and that's our own destiny. God bless you.